I want you to take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to Philippians chapter 3 again. Philippians chapter 3. Um, what I'm going to do this morning is we've come to this verse in Philippians chapter 3 um, that is simply my life prayer verse. Um, if you send any correspondence that's come out from me, you'll see Philippians 3.10 under my signature. Um, this is the verse that is my heart beats desire for myself and for my family. And you say, well, preacher, what do you pray for us? Well, Philippians 3.10. Uh, because this was Paul's desire for his own life. And, and when we look at this verse, now, I've, uh, if you've been around me very long, you've, you've probably heard me refer to this verse from time to time. Um, but what I want to do is go in and look at it in depth and go in and look at it exactly what was Paul meaning when he said this about himself. Because remember, as we looked at last week, the Apostle Paul had come to the place of giving this personal testimony of his own life. And he was given this personal testimony. He said, listen, I was wrapped up in my own religion until I encountered Christ. I was wrapped up in my own righteousness until I encountered Christ. And when I encountered Christ, I counted all those things but dung. I left them behind. I counted them as for no profit whatsoever that I may gain or, or if you will, receive Christ Jesus. Now, the, the thing is, for Paul uh, to understand that all these thing, things about his life that he deemed so precious in his life, that he's now left behind that he can gain the person of Jesus Christ, you would think with Paul, now that he has Christ, Paul would be absolutely satisfied. He, he would be absolutely suitable. I mean, listen, what else could Paul want? He has Christ. Well, I got news for you, folks. That wasn't Paul's single desire. It wasn't just to receive Christ. It was to know Christ. And so with that being said, I want you to stand in reverence to the reading of, G, of the Word of God. And we're just going to read this one verse together. And here's what it says. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. The way it really reads in the Greek is this way. That I may know him, experiential knowledge. That I may know the power of his resurrection. That I may know the fellowship of his suffering. And that I may know what it means to be conformed to his death. That's what Paul's desire was for his own life. Father, I come to you today. And Father, I pray as we look at this passage of Scripture. That Father, you would so mold and shape this desire within our hearts by your Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that Lord, we wouldn't be satisfied with just being saved. But Father, we'd want to walk in the fullness of who you are. Father, we wouldn't be satisfied with just knowing we're going to heaven. But, Father, we'd want to live in the realm of heaven here on earth. Father, we wouldn't be satisfied just knowing we went from death to life, but we'd want to live in the reality of your life on a day-to-day -day basis. Father, would you so mold this into us. And, Lord, we'll give you the praise, the honor, and the glory in Jesus' name. And all God's children said... You may be seated. Thank you so much. Well, you know, it's amazing how the Bible is so perfect in the way God gave it. And I believe the Bible is inerrant, inspired, and infallible in its original language. And it's amazing how God gives us pictures all through Scripture of the truths that He wants us to understand. And one of the truths that He wants us to understand throughout the New Testament is there's much more to the Christian life than just receiving Christ Jesus. I think some people think when they receive Christ Jesus, boy, they've arrived, everything's taken care of now. Boy, I can take my shoes off, I can relax, everything's good. Listen, to receive the life of the Lord Jesus is the beginning of your Christian walk. Uh, you become a babe in Christ at that point. Listen, God wants to mature you. First John says it this way, I write unto you little children. I write unto you young men. I write unto you fathers. Meaning that you and I are to grow in grace and knowledge. We begin as young children. We grow into young men. And prayerfully, we get to the place where we're living in spiritual maturity as fathers. That's God's desire for our lives. And I pray that's your desire for your life. But, but at the same time, Scripture gives us several examples 
uh, uh, in throughout Scripture where individuals have, have experienced the deliverance of God, but yet didn't want to go on with God. Let me give you a few of those. Israel comes to mind immediately. If you think of Israel, here is a people that, that God had done a supernatural work to get them to Egypt that he could eventually get them to the land of Canaan. But yet they didn't want to leave Egypt. God said, listen, I've got a land for you, but they didn't want to leave it. And so God turned up their nest, if you will. And as God turned up their nest, all of a sudden they got to the place they were wanting to go until they found out what they had up against them. And the Bible says when they found out the land of Canaan and they saw what was in the land of Canaan, being the giants and the walled cities, they determined, hey, we want to go, but we don't want to go. And essentially they said, listen, this, this ain't doable for us. Well, God never said it was to start with. God never told them to go and take the land. God said, I've already given you the land. God never told them to go fight the battles. God said, just go by faith and I'll fight the battles for you. But instead they decided, hey, we don't want to go on. Now, the problem with that is God got them out of Egypt, not that they could walk in the wilderness. God got them out of Egypt so he, they could walk in his provision. He got them out that he could bring them in. And so they experienced the deliverance of God, but yet didn't want to go on with God. A whole generation God had to remove because of that very sin. We, we could go on in the second generation of Israel. We see them now being willing to walk by faith. They come up to the edge of the Jordan, about to go across that, that Jordan that was overflowing its banks. And then there was these two and a half tribes. They were the tribe of Reuben and Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh. They came to Joshua and they said, Joshua, listen, we made a pact with uh, Moses and, and, and God approved it. And it's simply what it says is, he says, we don't have to go over. Matter of fact, Joshua chapter 1 says that they agreed with Moses that they would stay on this side of the Jordan. They would send their men over to fight with Israel, but then they would come back on the other side of the Jordan and take their residence over here. You say, well, what did God say about that? God said, let them do what they want to do. You know, it's amazing to me. I wish God forced us to grow, but he doesn't. I wish God forced us to walk in his provision, but he doesn't. So sometimes God will allow you to, to stay in a place where if you do not have this desire to know Christ in his fullness, he'll allow us to stay there. Why? Because we'll eventually realize how much we missed out. And can I tell you, the first two and a half tribes of Israel to be taken into Babylonian captivity, you want to take a guess who they were? Gad, Reuben, and half the tribe of Manasseh. We find this all through Scripture. Israel, after they got to the land of Canaan, now they've been delivered from Egyptian bondage. God's now brought them across the Jordan. God's now delivered the land into their hands, done supernatural works in which he delivered the land in their hands. And, and here's all God said to them. He said, you got to continue to drive out the Canaanites. That's all he said. And then he reminded them. He said, but remember, the battle's not your, the battle's mine. So what did Israel do? Well, they got tired. And so Judges chapter 1 says that Israel, instead of driving out the Canaanites, began to befriend the Canaanites, then to begin to marry the Canaanites, and then began to serve with the Canaanites, then began to live with the Canaanites, and eventually the Canaanites took authority over them. Didn't want to go on. You say, well, preacher, that's all Old Testament. Oh, okay, you want some New Testament. What about in the New Testament? What about the church of Corinth? How many of you agree that there was a remnant within the church of Corinth that it truly experienced the saving, delivering grace of the Lord Jesus? But here's what Paul said to him. He said, I desire to give you the meat of the word, but instead I'm having you give you the milk of the word because you can't handle the meat of the word. Then he said to the Hebrew believers this same truth. The Hebrew believers got in this same predicament. They were delivered by the grace of God but would not grow in their grace and knowledge. And so Paul would come to them in, in, in Hebrews chapter 5 and the beginning of chapter 6. And he said, listen, he said, do you not understand? I desire to give you the meat of the word, but I'm having to give you the milk of the word. Instead of being teachers, you're having to be taught the first oracles of God. Experienced the deliverance but didn't want to go on. Now, y'all got the point now? Say amen. amen. 
Now, what we looked at last week, we saw Paul has experienced by testimony the deliverance of the Lord Jesus. He's now come to the place of, of literally removing the robes of his, of his own righteousness, removing the robes of his own religion, and now taking up on the righteousness and the relationship of the Lord Jesus. And Paul's been saved, saved, saved. But Paul said that's not enough. I want more than that. Verse 10 that I may know him. This speaks of our intimacy with Christ Jesus. Now, what is this word here? Well, if you remember in the previous verses, go back with me in, a, in, in, in Philippians chapter 3. And just in the previous verses, uh, verse 8, Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of, Je of Christ Jesus my Lord. Now you say, well, wait a minute, Paul, you already acknowledge you counted all these other things but lost as if they were nothing, that you may gain the knowledge of Christ. Do you not have the knowledge of Christ? That word is a word that simply means revelation of Jesus Christ. How many of you agree when, when Paul experienced Christ on that road uh, to Damascus, how many of you agree that he experienced the person of Christ he had never experienced before? He got revelation to more than just a prophet. He got revelation of more than just a zealous man. He got revelation of the son of the living God who came to change him and save him and redeem him and set him free. So Paul, why do you keep asking to know him? Because it's a different word. The word know here is the word to experience. Now let me give you, let me give you an idea. Since I talked about Israel today, I'll just use that as my illustration. I remember when, I was, when, I, when the Lord saved me and I began to study the Bible and I began to, 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 began to teach and preach the Word of God, I began to be fascinated with the culture and the history of Israel. And so I'd studied it. I'd learned a little bit about it. But I found out when I went, I had no clue what it really was. I experienced what I thought I knew. In other words, instead of reading about it, I was sitting there looking at it. I was walking in it. Listen, folks, it was a whole different experience. Iris Blue told me before we went the first time, she said, Mac, if you go, it'll be equal to three years of seminary. I said, you're crazy. By the way, she was crazy. It wasn't equal to three years of seminary. It's more like four or five. And it changed my life. It changed my whole perspective on things. And you say, what, why, how's that got to do with this? Because, listen, I knew about Israel, but now I was experiencing what that land was like. Something different about that. Now, I'm going to get personal. Y'all, let me get personal. How many of y'all um, are married? Say amen. amen. How many of you agree when you dated your spouse, you got to know them? But how many of you agree when you got married, you really found out who they were? Amen? How many agree there was a whole different mindset of knowledge from the day you dated to the day you got married? That's Paul's desire. He said, Lord, he said, I've counted all these things but done that I may have the knowledge of you, a revelation of who you are. I have that now, but I'm not satisfied with that. I want to experience you in my life. I want to experience you every single moment of my life. Listen, I, I don't want to know what the joy of the Lord may, it looks like. I want to experience the joy of the Lord. I don't want to know what the peace of God that passes all us understanding, what it may look like or how it may be studied out or how it may be learned about. I don't even want to know how to articulate it in words. I want to experience it when I'm in that prison cell and when they're throwing stones at me. I want to be able to sit there and stand there in the peace of God and know that I'm experiencing Experiencing your peace in my life in that moment. I want more than just revelation. I want experience. Now you say, well, preacher, how do we experience the Lord Jesus? Well, let me ask you a question. If you're saved today, where does Christ abide? In you. So how do I experience the Lord Jesus? It's just where you get out of the way and let him be who he is. And he'll be all these things for you and in your life. Can I tell you today? I found this to be true in my life. Marriage is an amazing thing because it is such a sweet thing in, in such a fashion that the longer you're married, the more you're glad you're married. That's the way I feel, amen? 
But can I tell you, your relationship with Jesus Christ is even more than that. The more you experience him, the more you want to experience him. And that's where Paul is. He says, listen, folks, he said, I want you to know right here and now that I want to experience the Lord Jesus in every facet of my life. I want to know what it's like for him to capture my thoughts. I want to know what it's like for him to speak through me instead of me speaking for him. I want to know what it's like to be able to walk day by day in the absolute conscious presence that Jesus Christ is living his life through me. And it's not me living for him, but him living through me. I want to know what it's like to experience all that Jesus Christ is. You say, well, preacher, until we get to heaven, we're not going to know that. Listen, there's a Greek word for that. Phooey. You and I can know Jesus Christ here and now. Will we see him with our eyes? No. But can we see the evidence of him through our lives? Yes. We can experience Jesus here. We don't have to wait till we get to heaven. And I'm glad for that. And so this become Paul's anthem. This become Paul's cry. Listen, Ephesians chapter 3, here's what Paul prayed for the church of Ephesus. Verse 19, Ephesians 3, verse 19. Listen to what Paul prayed for the church of Ephesus. The same thing he prayed for himself. And to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. What does he mean passes knowledge? Passes just revelational knowledge. In other words, Paul said, I want to experience the love of Christ, which goes beyond what anybody could describe as the love of Christ in my life. That I may experience the fullness of who he is. Now, let me ask you a question. What would have happened the day you got married if you stood at the altar with your spouse and your spouse looked at you and said, now, honey or sweetie, whichever side of the spouse thing you're on amen honey or sweetie i want you to know i love you i want to be with you i want to spend my rest of my life with you but i want you to know there's many aspects of my life i'm never going to let you be a part of now how many of you agree right there you got a problem well let's take evangelism in the modern day and see if it fits lord i want you to save me so i can go to heaven but I want to control my own life. I want you to save me so I don't have to go to hell. But Lord, you need to understand something here. This is, this is a one-way thing here. I want what you can do for me. I'm not necessarily interested in who you are in me. In other, in other words, Lord, I, listen, I, I'm going to pray to you every now and then. I'm going to give you a token offering of worship every now and then. I'm going to show up to church every now and then. I, I mean, listen, Lord, I, I'm going to do some things to try to, to try to help you and to try to, to serve you and to try to worship you. But, Lord, I want you to understand, as far as to experience all of who you are in my life, I'm not interested in that. Listen, if that's your mindset, I've got a word for you. Come see me during the invitation. We'll get you saved. Boy, that didn't get many amens. Because that's, listen, that's what the Spirit of God does in our heart. The Spirit of God in our heart puts us to the place where we want to experience all of the Lord Jesus. It's a burning desire in the child of God. And, and I believe this. I'm old-fashioned, folks, and I know that, so y'all love me anyway, amen? But I believe that's not a desire God puts in some Christians. I believe that's a desire God puts in every Christian. I really do. Now, can we quench and grieve that desire? Yes, we can. But is it in there? Yes. And how do you know it's in there? Because when you're not walking in that kind of passion and that desire, you're absolutely miserable as a child of God. This was Paul's desire, that I may know him, experience him. Intimacy. Intimacy. And so what Paul said is, I want the expression of my life to be Christ. I want the experiencing of my life to be Christ. I want to experience him in every aspect of my life. And I want every aspect of my life to be an expression of who he is in and through me. Let me put it to you another way. Lord, I don't want to love my wife with my love. I want to love her with your love. 
Lord, I don't want to deal with this situation in my life <coughs> with my way of thinking. I want to deal with it in your way of thinking. Y'all see the difference? That's what Paul's saying. I want to know him. Know him. Know him. Listen, my prayer for you and my prayer for me is this, that the single heartbeat of our lives is a passion to pursue the experiential knowledge of the Lord Jesus. And folks, listen. Watch how it works. If I'm experiencing his joy and I'm experiencing his power and I'm experiencing his peace and I'm experiencing his life and I'm experiencing his love and you're experiencing his love and you're experiencing his peace and you're experiencing his joy and you're experiencing the power in Christ. Can I ask you a question today? If you're experiencing the same thing I'm experiencing, then how much greater is our fellowship going to be? Y'all with me? Say amen. amen. Passion. Passion. I want to know him. Intimacy with Christ. Secondly, he said, not only do I want to know him intimately, but I want to know specifically about him in three areas. I want to know the power of his resurrection. Now, what in the world is Paul speaking of here, this power of his resurrection? Well, let's do me a favor real quick. Go back one book, take a left at the book of Philippians, go to Ephesians, and go to Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul's praying for the church of Ephesus. And you'll never believe what he prays for the church of Ephesus, the same thing he prays for himself. Notice what it says in, in Ephesians chapter 1, in verse number 16. <coughs> he said, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. How many agree that's what Paul's desire? Now watch it. That the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened. That you may know experiential knowledge here. You may know what is the hope of his calling. That you may know what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Now I want you to catch this. Notice how it's worded. That you may experience the riches of his inheritance in the saints. Listen folks. We always talk about our inheritance in Christ. How many of you agree we become joint heirs with Christ? But listen to what this verse says. He said, Paul said, I'm not praying that you experience what you have inherited in Christ. I'm praying you experience what Christ has in you as his inheritance. You never saw yourself as being the inheritance of Christ, did you? In other words, what in the world would make me something that Christ would view me as his inheritance? Well, can I tell you today, he prayed a handsome price to get you and I. And so you and I are his inheritance and he is our inheritance. It's a joint inheritance. And Paul says, I pray you experience this. Now, watch what he goes on to say. This passage amazed me. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe? Now, how many of you agree today? that Paul's desire for the church of Ephesus is that they would experience the power of Christ. What does it say about this power? Exceeding greatness of it. In other words, let me put it to you this way. <coughs> His power manifested towards us is far beyond any power that this world or anybody else could ever get. Exceeding greatness. How is that possible to those that believe? Faith. So if he's given me his power... How many of you agree today that when the Bible says of the Lord Jesus that all power in heaven and earth was given unto him? All right, do you have Christ? So if you have Christ and all power in heaven and earth was given unto him, then guess what? Isn't that a lot better than going around praying, God, would you give me power? And so here's, what is this power specifically Paul's talking about? Well, watch what it says. According to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him on his own right hand in heavenly places, far above principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head of all things to the church. So, Paul, what power are you praying that Ephesus would experience? 
The same power in which God the Father used to resurrect God the Son out of that grave. And by doing that, what, what was accomplished? Christ was elevated. Christ was lifted to be far above every principality and power and might and dominion. So Paul prays here. He said, Lord, he said, listen, I've been saved. I have revelation of who you are. And by your word, you gloriously saved me. And I've counted all my religion as done. I've counted all my own righteousness as done that I may gain you. But Lord, I want much more. I want to experience all of who you are. And more specifically, I want to experience the same power that brought you out of the grave. I want to experience in my life that you. Now, wait a minute, preacher. Are you saying every day of my life I can live in the realm of the power of God that resurrected Jesus Christ from the dead? No, that's not what I'm saying. That's what God said. It's right there. Say, well, what does this power do? Well, let me ask you a question. When God the Father raised the Son, what took place through that resurrection? How many of you agree death was conquered? How many of you agree hell was conquered? How many of you agree sin was conquered? Uh-oh. So what are you saying? Paul's saying, Lord, I've been changed. I know you by salvation. But Lord, I want to experience the victory that I have in you. Through the power of your resurrection. Lord, I want to know that when those temptations come up in my life, that at that moment and that time, that you become all that you said you would be in my life. And Lord, I would be enabled to not only resist, but not only to not desire it again. The power of the resurrection. I remember for years, folks, for several years, I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. I had little issues in my life that God was dealing with me about, and I was trying to get victory over them in my life. And, and I'll never forget, it was almost on a daily basis, I'd find myself confessing those things over and over and over again. And almost on a daily basis, I was, Lord, I was praying, Lord, I pray you'd give me victory over these things. I'm so tired of confessing them every day. You ever been there? And then one day God showed me in his word, that he's already given me victory. And for the first time in my life, I prayed this way. Lord, thank you today that I already have the victory of Christ in my life. Lord, thank you today that I already have resurrected power working inside of my life. Thank you today that the same power that conquered sin and the same power that made an open display of the devil, that same power is the power that resonates inside of me because you're alive in me. And so, Lord, right now, I want to thank you for the victory I have in you. And right now, I claim that victory by the name of Jesus. And right now, I pray that that victory would work in me because it's already in me. And you know what I found? I found a couple weeks went by, a couple months went by, and one day it hit me. You know, I haven't confessed that sin in a long time. I hadn't really even thought about it much. You know why? Because resurrection power not only protects you from temptation, resurrection power protects you from your own desires. You don't even begin to desire it anymore. I have people come to me all the time and say, Pastor, how can I be delivered from this habit or this in my life? I say simply this, number one, if you're saved by the glory of God and you absolutely know that you have a personal relationship with Jesus, then every moment you get up, every day you get up, you get up and you say this to the Lord, Lord, right now I want to thank you that there's no power in heaven and earth. There's no power of principalities or powers or anything that can be named on this earth can have power over me because right now I'm walking in your victory and you are all I need. And all of a sudden it becomes reality becomes reality. Paul said, I want to experience this in my life. I want to experience this in my life. Now you know why I pray this for y'all and for me. Amen? Amen? Watch this. Now if we stop there, how many of we agree we could shout and go home? Paul didn't stop there. He said, but Lord, there's something else I desire. Not only to experience you 
intimacy. Not only to experience the power of your resurrection, victory, but I want to experience the fellowship of your suffering, identity. What do you mean? Paul said, Lord, I understand that if I'm experiencing all of who you are in my life, and I begin to walk in the victory that, that you have given me in when you gave me yourself, I understand that my life will start being so marked and identified with you that those that didn't like you then will not like me now. Now, here's the thing, folks. You have to understand from Scripture, and I'm going to deal with this from a scriptural matter, but I want to deal with it from a practical aspect too. Scripture says that those that live in righteousness will be persecuted. That's, that's a promise. Not a promise we want to quote all the time, but it's a promise. It's just as much of a promise as I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And so it is a promise. Matter of fact, the Bible says of, of Paul when he was converted. Now, how many of you agree when you're converted, you're, you're excited as all outdoors? And, and how many agree that there, there's not a lot that's going to pour water upon your fire at that moment you're converted? Well, watch what the first word the Lord gave Paul after he was converted. Let me read it to you. Acts chapter 9, verse 15 and 16. Here's the message the Lord sent Paul. He said, But the Lord said unto him, being Ananias, Go, for he is a chosen vessel to me, to bear my name before the Gentiles, the kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now, you remember, Paul, the Lord encountered this man and said, Listen, there's a man over there. He, if you'll go find him, he's praying. Let me put it to you another way. I done something many, and he's not the same anymore. And he don't know what else to do but pray. You'll find him praying. And by the way, would you give him this message when you find him? That he needs to know what great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now, how many of you agree? That wouldn't be the exact first things you want to hear when you're saved. How many agree? That would kind of, like, whoa, wait a minute here. What did I say? Listen, <coughs> but you have to understand, with the Apostle Paul and all his zealousness when he was, was a Judaizer, he, now he's just as zealous for the person of Christ. Why? Because Christ has changed him. And now his passion's for Christ. And so what that really meant, what the Lord was really saying to Paul was, Paul, I'm going to use you in such a way. I'm going to work through you in such a way that when people see you, they're going to think it's me. And Paul, just as they treated me, they'll treat you. Because you'll become so connected with who I am. Say, preacher, you pray that for us? I do. But in this way. Because, see, we live in a country today where this is not a problem right now. Hang on, it's coming. But it's not right now. But here's the thing, folks. Here's what I pray for you and I. That when we go out into this world, we go out into the Ellenboroughs and the Forest Cities and the, and the uh, Rutherfordtons and the Shelbys and the Bowling Streams, and we go out into all these different communities around here that people will so recognize something about us that will catch them by surprise. And when they see how we react in a circumstance and they see how we treat others and they see how we are always faithful and desiring and always wanting to communicate and talk about the things of God and they see us respond in a tragedy in such a way that, that the peace of God begins to reign in our hearts that they would begin to recognize, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That can't be him. That's somebody else. They're right. His name is Jesus. And that everywhere we go, we'd be identified with Christ. Wouldn't it be great to know that your life and my life would be such a display of who Christ was that you'd never have to open your mouth one time and people would identify you as a Christian. And then when you do open your mouth, your life authenticates your words. 
See, we live in a day today where our words try to trump our life. We live in a day today where our words try to mask our living. But how about if our life authenticates our words? And we become so identified with Christ that everywhere we go, it's just Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Amen? Amen. You know, it's amazing. I, uh, I loved when me and my wife were first married, and even today we still sometimes get this, but I've been bald-headed ever since I was in college. And I love walking with Lisa in the mall or in public. You know why? Especially when we were first married, it was amazing because um, we, we would walk down the, the, the store or we'd walk down a hallway or something like that, and somebody would walk up to me and said, wow, what a beautiful daughter you have. <laughs> See, what they saw affected what they believed. Y'all getting this? What about when we walk down a mall? My, what a beautiful Christ you have. What they see affects what they believe. Paul said, I want to be so identified with you, Christ, that everywhere I go, the only thing they know about me is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You say, preacher, is that possible? Are you living in a fantasy land? Well, let's look at the book of Acts. The book of Acts says that the apostles went out into this world. And as the apostles went out in this world, there was a group in the, in the town of Antioch that was literally in, as a form of persecution, as a form of rebuke, as a form of reviling. They said to the apostles, who do you think you are, Christ? Who do you think you are, Christians? They saw so much of the marks in Christ and the apostles they coined the phrase Christian. Isn't it amazing the very word Christian was meant to be a, a rebuke? And now we hold it up as a banner of glory. And we should. Why? Because what does the word Christian mean? It means to be Christ-like. And so Paul said, I, I want to be so identified with you, Lord, that everywhere I go they see me. Last thing and I'm done. Not only identity with Christ, but conformity to Christ. And being made conformable unto his death. Now, here's the amazing thing about this in the life of Paul. He was writing this in the last days of his life. And so this was a burning passion for Paul. Not just when the God gloriously saved him. But this was a burning passion of Paul all the way to the last days of his life. What does it mean to be conformed in the image of his death? It means simply this. That, Lord, the pathway you took to have resurrected life, I want to take to experience your life. You say, well, what pathway did the Lord have to take? The cross. The cross. How many of you agree today there could not have been of any self in Christ or he wouldn't have went to the cross? And so Paul understood that the way that this life that he wanted to experience in Christ Jesus, that he would be conformed utterly to that life as he first had to be conformed to the death. Meaning, Paul would say it this way, Lord, would you so allow me to die to me that the only thing left to me is you? You know, it's amazing. I, um, sometimes I get enamored with, um, with different things. And, and there's a couple occasions, especially when we were in Israel. We saw some amazing, and, and when we were in Budapest, Hungary, we saw this as well, some amazing architecture and some amazing um, artistic sculpturing, if you will. And you know what, you know what a sculpture does? He takes a stone. That's just a rough old stone. Has no visual image of it whatsoever. If you look at this stone and you find out what this, this artist is about to make out of this stone, you say there's no way that can happen. And then he begins to chip away at that stone. 
And you know what he's doing? He's chipping away everything from that stone that don't look like the image he's trying to get come out. That's what it means to be conformed in the death of the Lord Jesus. Can I tell you, the moment God saved us, he's trying to chip away everything on you and me that don't look like him. That the only thing left is him. Why? Because Jesus said of himself, unless a grain of wheat, speaking of himself, fall on the ground and die, it abideth alone. Never bec becomes anything. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. And then he followed that up after saying that about himself. He says now, unless a man loses his life, he could not gain life eternal. So in other words, what Jesus said, folks, you need to understand, I must go to the cross and die. Why? Because only then will my life be manifested throughout. I must die. But it's the same way. We must take up our cross and follow him. Why? That the life that is within us can be revealed through us because it's not being masked by the selfishness of ourselves. Isn't that amazing? So how does Jesus sing? You decrease, he increases. It's that simple. Now, watch this with me. And I, I want to read these verses. And I, I wasn't going to do this, but I am. And I'm done. I'm closing. I promise. Look at me at Philippians chapter 3, and let me show you how big of a passion this was for Paul. Look at verse 12. <coughs> Not as though I already attained, either were already perfect or mature, but I follow after that, that if I may apprehend that for which I have apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I, not count my, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before, I press towards the mark. What is that mark? For the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. What is that prize? What is that high calling? That I may know him. The power of his resurrection, fellowship of his suffering, be made conformable unto his death. Paul said, all I desire, all I'm pressing towards, my whole passion, my whole life is for one thing, and that's to experience more of Jesus Christ. Father, I come to you today, and Lord, I pray that's our passion. Lord, as I, as I think about all that you've done for us, Lord, I think about you saving us. I think about you redeeming us. I think about you taking us from death to life. I think about that our sins are as, we're as scarlet, but they've been made white as snow. I think about, Lord, the promise we have in your word that one day we will spend eternity in your presence. And not only that, but we'll rule and reign with you in eternity. Father, I think about what you've done. I think about what you're going to do. But Lord, my prayer is that as much passion as we have for what you've done and as much passion as we have for what you're going to do, Father, we'd have equal amount of passion for what you're doing here, in us, right here, right now. And Lord, our passion would be that we would experience all of who you are in our lives. Lord, we wouldn't be satisfied by just knowing we got our ticket out of hell. We wouldn't be satisfied with just giving you a token part of our life. But Father, the only thing that would satisfy us is that all of who you are would become all of who I am. Oh God, would you work that in us. Lord, there may be somebody here today that Father, maybe they've never came to the place of knowing in a, in a revelation way about the person of the Lord Jesus in salvation. Father, maybe today you would reveal yourself to them in that way. But Lord, for us that are saved, burn within us a desire to know you in all your fullness. To have intimacy with you, to have victory in you, to have identity with you and to be conformed to you. 
may that be our passion and our heartbeat. In Jesus' name. And all God's children said, please stand, every head bowed, every eye closed.